Well, good afternoon. And I appreciate the opportunity to try to convince you that biomedicine has been critical to the renaissance of Cleveland and will be even more important as Cleveland drives toward its, uh, toward its future. But you're all young, too, too young to know that there's really a renaissance in Cleveland. I need to give you a little bit of background so that you understand where we're coming from. You know, in the first half of the 20th century, Cleveland was an industrial powerhouse. It was one of the five most populous cities in the country. It had dozens of, uh, of headquarters of Fortune 500 companies, dozens in the, in the 100, Fortune 100 companies. Uh, it was steel. It was auto parts, it was things, it was competitive and boisterous. The competition was the plant down the, down the road. The goal was making a lot of money and selling a lot of things. Didn't pay much attention to sustainability or knowledge or the competition that wasn't just down the road. So by the 1960s, Japan had taken over steel making. Detroit and the Cleveland Auto Parts suppliers were reeling from the international competition. We still thought the competitor was down the road, not across the, the sea. And things started to unravel. By the 1960s, we were losing corporate headquarters. And the economy of things was failing. A little bit after that, the river caught on fire. Some of you think that Burning River 100-mile run was just a nice, cute name. Uh-uh. The river actually caught on fire. It was so polluted. We didn't think much of ourselves in those days. I moved to Cleveland in the 1980s, and I'm not sure I completely understood how far down Cleveland was upon itself until the first time I drove to the airport. There was a new sign up on one of the big billboards there, and it said, great big letters, go Browns. And then I read the smaller letters underneath, and take the Indians with you. When I got to Washington, uh, though, because this was in the days of old paper tickets, I did something I never knew. I left my ticket on the plane. And the airline called me and said, we'll hold it for you when you're coming back. So I get in my line and uh, get up to the counter and uh, give them my name, and she hands me the ticket. I said, don't you want to see an ID? She says, honey, this ticket's for Cleveland. <laughs> uh, it's, it, was, it was something of a stunner. But the fact that you don't relate to these kinds of things now, there has been a renaissance. We have the biggest theater district outside of New York. We have community of, uh, of uh, uh, an active community downtown. You can't get an apartment downtown. The occupancy rate's 98%. It's huge. We're building all over. The campus is building. There are cranes downtown. It's, it's all improving. How did we get there? And I would argue that one of the things that we've done is we've capitalized on one of our strengths. And the, one of those strengths is biomedicine. So the most direct evidence that biomedicine is a strength of Cleveland and a driver is that the top two employers in Cleveland employ the most people are the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. Cleveland Clinic employs about 32,000 people, University Hospitals about 16,000. Actually, five out of the 10 of the top employers are engaged in biomedicine because we should include Metro Health, we should include Case Western Reserve because we are a powerhouse there. And I think that all those US government employees, a lot of them are right over there at the VA hospital. So biomedicine is an economic driver, if for, if for nothing else, by the number of people that it, that it employs. Our clinical uh, operations in Cleveland, especially those who are, that are affiliated with the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, are very high quality. The VA over there, anything that the VA ranks, we rank in the top five. We have a very classy public safety net hospital in Metro. It is famous for its trauma unit, for its burn unit, and for its work on improving health conditions 
in the uh, in disadvantaged populations. Nationally famous for that. Uh, our two large uh, health systems, university hospitals and the Cleveland Clinic, are are well up there in U.S. News and World Report. The Cleveland Clinic's been in the top five for decades. There is excellence in clinical care here. And this spreads outside of Cleveland. The Cleveland Clinic has outposts now in Las Vegas, Toronto, Florida, Abu Dhabi, and now London, all over. And they draw patients from all over the country and all over the world. Our clinical care is a famous attribute of Cleveland. But we are also leaders in the way clinical care is delivered. And we start to meld into the knowledge economy as we look at how our hospital systems and our physicians look at the delivery of care, the innovations, the use of electronic health records, the innovative use of electronic health records to improve care, uh, the learning health systems that have been created here. Metro has a 17-year back, uh, background of electronic health records. The Cleveland Clinic has a spin-out that now uh, explores, that now looks at, uh, I think, over 20 million electronic health records around the country. We have a great deal of imagination here and drive to figure out how to deliver excellent medical care at a lower cost and to utilize the tools of technology to do so. But that's not the only virtue of biomedicine and discovery in this area. We have extraordinary basic science and clinical translational discovery here. We are a hotbed of cardiology neuro and neuroscience. We are a hotbed of cancer. The discoveries that are happening here are not only important in driving the knowledge economy, but also in spinning out new companies. I bet you don't know that Cleveland and Minneapolis duke it out every year for the largest investment in biotech between the coasts. This year, we're winning. You know, last time I looked, and it's only, it's only October, and I last looked at the beginning of September, we were over $230 million in external investments. Now, that's on top of the 500 plus million dollars that the, the medical school and its clinical affiliates bring into this community in external research funding. So just the economic driver is there, but more important, it's the knowledge driver and the spark that we bring out uh, into the uh, community and the imagination that we pursue. One of the hotbed areas here in the biotech community is imaging. Not only do we have Philips, which is an international corporation, have a huge uh, uh, research facility here. Siemens is setting one up. And there are myriad small companies, either spun out from us, or some of them are graduates who have gone out and then founded a company in the imaging space. That happens to be one of the fastest growing employment areas in, uh, in the Cleveland community really important things that change the lives of patients and change our ability to detect disease early, to follow disease, and even to classify disease with imaging. It's quite remarkable. Our biotech uh, community is, uh, is thriving, and it thrives in part because of its relationship with the university and the knowledge economy. Now, there is no knowledge economy unless there's a knowledgeable workforce. And that's why the university is so important in, the, uh, in this whole nexus of, uh, of biomedicine. If you just have what's out there now and you don't add new personnel or new ideas to it, you'll soon be out of gas in the, in the, uh, in the knowledge economy. You have to keep driving it with people like you, with people who are in biomedical engineering and biochemistry and you know, people who are in anthropology and looking to make life better in the, in the biomedical space. We're about to plant a flag in the medical school and the dental school and the nursing school to establish ourselves as a world destination for education in the health sciences. 
we, are, we broke ground on October 1st for a new building that's going to lie between 93rd and 100th and between Euclid and Chester. It's on an 11 acre site. It's going to be a huge building because it's going to have all the uh, preclinical parts of all three schools sitting in that one building. It's going to be magnificent. It's in the shape of a rectangle with an atrium in the middle with the opportunity for students to exchange ideas in that atrium. There will be food. There will be parking across the street. Those are the two big questions. Don't worry, we got that covered. It's going to be a, it's going to be a lovely building and a real opportunity to do new things. But we're also going to be able to do new things in terms of the incorporation of technology to enhance learning. We have a wonderful simulation center. We're going to be able to put avatars in there that can respond in a variety of ways so that the first time you struggle from giving bad news does not have to be with a patient. Uh, the first time you struggle with someone with mental illness does not have to be with a patient. So those avatars are going to be very important. We can progress to actors and simulated patients. Um, we have one dad, who, one simulated dad, who is capable of falling off the chair and simulating a seizure when you give him the bad news. That teaches you how to, how to uh, respond in a humane way to, uh, to what's going on. But some of the most exciting things and uses of technology in there are going to be the use of Watson. You know who Watson is? IBM, artificial intelligence. You know, Watson has been going to medical school, actually. And we've been trying to teach him his bedside manner, something to be desired. But boy, is he smart. Does he accumulate information? He accumulates it like mad. What we've been trying to do is get him to be thinking in his beady little brain about certain diseases where we have great issues with making decisions. And then we're going to let him work with students and show what something with all the possibilities and all the knowledge that's out there can do, um, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the way the students think it through. What we try to teach our students is not the facts. You know very well that you've got a handheld that has all the facts that you can uh, muster you know, at, your, at your fingertips. You know, when I was a medical student, my professor of medicine said to me, the very best medical textbook back in those days, cost $450. Doctor, what did you bring to the party? And you have to bring something other than that. You have to bring your ability to think like a doctor and your ability to interact with a patient in a humane and, uh, and gracious way and in a positive, therapeutic way. And we are paying a lot of attention to that. It's not just what you know. It's how you're able to process it and how you're able to convey it to, to a patient. Actually, what you know changes dramatically. Again, when I was in medical school, they told me half of what we're teaching you is wrong. We just don't know which half. Um, that's pretty much true now. There are a lot of things that are articles of faith in medicine that really aren't. The, the, the facts that you need to know, but the thought process and the way you approach a patient and the way you go after this, that's the key. That's part of the knowledge economy. And that's true, the, the generation of a hypothesis, the, the, the accumulation of information, the testing of the hypothesis, and the move forward is, is, is true for a scientist as much as it, as it is uh, for a physician. We're also going to be using some re a remarkable device called the HoloLens. Have you seen the movies with the HoloLens? Well, this is something that Microsoft developed for gaming. It sort of looks like a halo with, uh, you know, with um, uh, glass, uh, you know, hang downs there. And what you can do is you can see through that holograms that have been created that we will create that will cement the learning in anatomy and pharmacology. How does a patient's gait relate to the lesion in his brain? All those things. But the, what's cool about the HoloLens, and is different from other kinds of virtual reality, 
is if you're on Oculus Rift or some of the other um, you know, virtual reality devices, you are in that virtual world. If you're in the HoloLens, you can see everybody else as well as the holograms. So the teacher or the facilitator can see the students looking at the heart that's beating and has the lesion in it, and they can see whether they're looking at the right thing, whether they look confused, whether it's, it's, it's resonating with them, and they can discuss it uh, in, a, in, you know, in an ordinary way while they're seeing a remarkable illustration of what we want to convey. This is going to really change, I think, the way people remember, uh, uh, remember what we teach them because uh, there's some, uh, some good pedagogical data that if you can visualize well what you're being taught, the retention is much, much greater. So we're looking forward to that as a device. We're also providing the opportunity for our students to have intensive uh, concentration, areas of concentration within the medical school curriculum. Urban health is the first one we have. You can concentrate on the problems of the inner city. Dr. Madigan showed you that the, uh, the statistics for uh, Cleveland that made you think it was a third world country. The uh, infant mortality rate in the inner city of Cleveland is three times that in the United States as a whole. It approximates the Gaza Strip. That's an embarrassment. That is an embarrassment. So uh, we, uh, we need people who are going to be interested in urban health and to see how, they're, uh, how it's going to work. Right now we're recruiting students for a wellness and prevention concentration. And we're also recruiting students into humanities and medicine. There are two more pathways that we're going to stand up uh, probably next year. One of them is world medicine. And world medicine is going to take in the strategies in which med by which medicine is delivered as well as the diseases that are more common elsewhere than they are here. So I think it's going to be fascinating. And also, we're going to have a concentration in systems and entrepreneurship in medicine. This is going to be, I think, a very interesting thing because doctors should know how medical systems operate. It shouldn't be left to administrators. We need to know that, and we need to take ownership of that so we do well by our patients. Our goal by the interprofessional education we deliver, by the, the technologically advanced and the, the thoughtful curriculum that we deliver, we hope to become a destination for healthcare education and continue to put Cleveland on the map and continue to advance the knowledge economy in Cleveland. It won't happen unless we do that. We will be strong here. We are going to envision the future. The best, best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you.